In this lecture, I'm going to show you how to download and install SQL Developer. I have included a file with the link to the SQL Developer downloads page in the resources section of this lecture. So you just need to click on the view resources button, which is above the upper right corner of this video. Once you get to the page, you will probably get a page like this one asking you to accept cookies. The page needs them to work properly, so go ahead and click on Agree and Proceed. As usual, you have to accept the license agreement. Now scroll down to the downloads links. If you are using a 64 bits version of Windows, you can download the installer that includes the Java Development Kit or JDK. I will download the one that doesn't include the JDK just to show you how to proceed in case you are running a 32-bit Windows. So click on download and log in with your Oracle account. And click on save to start the download. When it finishes, go back to the previous page to download the JDK. Again, you need to accept the license and click on the appropriate download link depending on your operating system. Click on save and wait. Now the first thing you need to install is the JDK, so go ahead and run the installer. If you are on Windows 8 or above, it will ask you to allow the installer to run. To continue, click Yes. and then click next, and next, and wait for the installation to complete. This can take a couple of minutes or less depending on your computer speed. To accept the default destination folder, click Next. and at the end click close. You now have the JDK installed and are ready to install SQL Developer. Actually, SQL Developer doesn't need to be installed. You just need to extract the zip file you downloaded, so go ahead and do it. I'm going to extract it into my downloads folder and I'm going to change the folder name, but you can choose a different location and name if you want to. When the extraction finishes, I will recommend to create a shortcut to the application so that you can run it from the desktop. So double click on the folder that was created and create the shortcut. Now go ahead and run it. 
When it runs for the first time, it will ask you for the path where the JDK was installed. So I'm going to click on the Browse button and navigate to the JDK location. I need to specify the root folder for the JDK. So I'm going to click on Select Folder here and then click on OK. I usually don't like applications to send you such statistics, so in this dialog I'm going to clear this checkbox and click on OK. And with this, you have Oracle SQL Developer configured and ready to be used to access your database. Great! So the first tip I'm going to show you is useful if you want or need to change the language of the user interface. In my case, it is currently in Spanish, as you can see here. Even though Spanish is my first language, I usually like to have programs installed in English because it is usually easier to find help and documentation for the English versions. People might try to help you by saying, go to this option, click on that button, or change this setting. But if you have the program in other language, things can get complicated at times. So I want a SQL developer in English. So to begin, I need to close it if it is running and go to the installation folder. To do that, I'm going to right click on the shortcut and click on open file location. Once there, I'm going to open the SQL Developer folder and then the Beam folder. Here, there's a file called sqldeveloper.conf, which is the one I need to edit to change the language. I'm going to use Sublime Text to edit it, but you can use any other text editor, such as Notpile, for example. To change the language, I need to add a new setting here. There's not a specific place to put this new setting, so I'm going to put it here almost at the beginning. I will put a comment here to help me remember what it is for in case I open the file again in the future. And now I'm going to add the new setting. We need to use the add VM option command to pass the parameter to the Java virtual machine when it starts the application. So I'm going to copy it from here. And the parameter we need to add is user.language and I will set it to en for English. And that's it. I can now save the file and open SQL Developer again. And yes, it is now in English. In this lecture, I'm going to show you how to create database connections. So to create a new connection, right-click on Connections, which is here in this panel to the left, and select New Connection. On this window, you have to give the connection a name, which I'm going to call Sys, but you can name it however you like. For this connection, I'm going to use the Sys user, so I go ahead and type Sys and enter the password. Here, there's an option to define a color to identify this connection. If you are working or planning to work with more than one database, you should really use this option to minimize your chances of confusing them and making critical mistakes. I have seen people mistakenly delete data from production databases, thinking they were doing it on their test one. And believe me, you don't want to be in that situation. So, please, Always set the connection color. Now, because I'm using the Sys account, 
Here in the raw list, I'm going to select sysdba, but if you are using a normal user, you don't need to change it. If you are running your Oracle database on your local computer, you can leave localhost as the hostname. Otherwise, you need to write the name or the IP address of the machine where the database is running. 1521 is the default part of the Oracle listener, so most of the times you won't need to change that. And XE is the default instance name for the Express Edition, so if you're not working with an Express Edition instance, you will need to change the system identifier or SID. Now you can go ahead and click on the test button. If everything is correct, the test will succeed and you can now save the connection. If you get any error, just review your settings and try again. If you still have problems, don't panic. I'm here to help you. Just pass your problem to the course discussion forum and I will do my best to help you out. Once the connection is created, you can confirm it is OK by double clicking on it. If everything is correct, you will get no errors and the SQL worksheet will open ready to accept SQL commands. See this red frame here? That is the color I set for my connection. If I move to this one, it changes to blue, so I immediately know what connection I'm working with. And that's very useful. SQL Developer is a very powerful tool. As you may have noticed, it includes many features you are probably not planning to use, at least by now. And even if it is not noticeable, loading all those features has an impact on the application startup time and its performance. So my recommendation is that if you don't use them, you should disable them. And I'm going to show you how easy that is. Here in the Tools menu, click on Features, and you are going to see that there are several feature groups here. So what you have to do is expand these groups to see which features you think you don't need. So I'm going to expand database, which includes a lot of features. By now, I don't need data miner, OLAP. I'm not using Application Express, so I don't need this one. I can disable change management and database card too. Let's see what else. RESTful, SPATIAL, UNIT TEST, and XML schema. Here in database migrations, there's a lot of options, but I'm not working on any migrations, so I can disable the whole group. Let's see what else. I'm not doing any version control for the things I do here, so I should be able to disable it. But for some reason, Data Modeler depends on subversion, so I will have to leave it enabled. OK, so I just need to apply my changes. And as you can see, a restart is needed, so let's click on Yes. And as you can see, now the tools menu doesn't include things I don't need. Now it's your turn. If you didn't do it with me, pause the course now and go disable anything you don't need before moving to the next tip. Yes, I really mean it. In general, if you care about performance and security, disabling things you don't need is usually considered to be a good practice. OK, see you in the next tip. Now, how do you execute commands? It's also very easy. I'm going to run a very simple select statement here just to show you how to execute commands. There are actually two ways to do it. The first one is by using this toolbar we see here at the top. You don't need to mark the command text. Just make sure that you are positioned on a line that is part of the command you want to run, and then press the play button. 
and by the way, commands must end with a semicolon. The other way to execute a command is by pressing Ctrl Enter. I always use this method because it is more efficient to do things on the keyboard than having to move your hand to grab the mouse and click on the button. Now let's see how to run a script. But what is a script? When you have a group of commands or instructions that you want to execute in one run, that is, without you having to execute them individually, that is called a script. I'm going to add a second command here so that we have a script. Okay, so to run a script you have in the editor, there are two ways also. The first one is by using the toolbar. As you can see, both statements were executed and we have the results of both commands here in the script output. The second method to execute a script is by pressing the F5 key. And that is the one I use because, again, for me, it is more efficient to do things on the keyboard. And if you don't have your script in the editor, but it is an external file, you can reference it by using the add sign followed by the path and name of the file. And then you can either use the toolbar or the F5 key to actually run it. Okay, that's it. See you in the next tip. I'm going to show you something here. I'm going to run this command. Oops, something didn't go well. As you can see, the error message gives me some information to help me identify the problem, which includes the line and column numbers. Since I only ran this command, I know the problem must be somewhere here. But if I run the whole script, it is no longer that easy. I can see the line number I'm currently at here, but that doesn't really help much. But there's a section here that is called the line gutter. And if I right click on it, there's an option to toggle line numbers. As you can see, now I have line numbers here and it is much easier to investigate errors. Now, there's another useful thing about the line gutter. Let's say I want to copy this command here, so I'm going to select it. Sorry, I left the S out. It's not easy for me to do it quickly with the mouse, and that is why I tend to prefer the keyboard, as I have said many times. But if for any reason I want to use the mouse, I can actually use the line gutter to select complete lines of text more easily. I just need to click and drag. Click and drag. It's so easy. This is another setting of the line gutter. but it is enabled by default, so you don't need to do anything besides knowing it exists. Go ahead, try it. When I write SQL code, I usually do something like this. I mean, I put the select in one line, the from in another line, and so on. Usually I even use tabs to indent the where clause when I have more than one condition. But sometimes I'm just lazy and don't care about those things and just write everything in the same line. Oh, 
Also, I sometimes end up switching between upper and lower case without noticing it, and one command looks very different from the other one. Fortunately, SQL Developer has an auto formatting feature which is activated by pressing Ctrl F7, and by default formats everything you have in the editor. As you can see now, my two commands look more similar. All of the keywords are now in uppercase and both commands are just one line. But this format is not really what I want, so let's see what we can do about it. I'm going to go to Preferences, Database, SQL Formatter, and Oracle Formatting. By default, you are probably going to have the All Preferences profile selected, but you can change it to SQL, so let's see how it works. If I press Ctrl F7 again, now things look different. Keywords are still in uppercase, and now I have the commands separated in several lines each. Let me undo this just to show you something. I'm going to add a new line here and format again. As you can see, I lost the blank line I just added. Also, it separated the commands in too many lines and I don't really like it. So, let's undo this again and see what else we can do about it. Well, we can edit the profile we're using, and there are actually a lot of things we can customize about it. Here I can change alignment options, indentation. Here I'm going to tell it to indent ends and ors because that is what I like to do. Here in line breaks, I'm going to clear this one. What else? I don't want it to remove my blank lines, so I'm going to change this to preserve existing. I don't want to change anything about case line breaks. And... I wanted to make sure there's always one white space around operators and one space after commas. And I like keywords in uppercase, so I'm not going to change anything else. So I'm going to click on OK and see how it works. Good. Things look very similar to what I would have done, so I'm happy with it. Now, one final thing. As I mentioned earlier, it formats everything by default. But if that is not what you want, you just have to select the code you do want to be formatted and press Ctrl F7, and only that code will be affected. Okay, if you are writing code that will only be run once, you might just don't care about formatting it. But if you are writing code that will later be part of a script or an application, or if you are doing this as an assignment or homework for college, or maybe you are applying for a job, then you should really pay attention to it and take advantage of this formatting feature. Okay, see you in the next lecture. Check this out. I have this command and I have this result. Here you can see there are several cells that show the word null. You may already know that, but that is not really what I have stored in the database. Null means the lack of a value. It is not an empty string, it is not a white space, and it is not zero. Null means that there is no value, so its value is unknown or undefined. 
Now, nulls are actually very important, and having them displayed the way we have them here doesn't really help to differentiate them from cells that have actual values. So this tip is about making nulls display in a special way, so we can easily recognize them. I'm going to open the Preferences window again, and in the Database section, I'm going to select the Advanced option. And once there, I'm going to select a different background color from the list. I'm going to select light gray. And now, as you can see, it is much easier to identify nulls at first sight. We don't even need to read or pay much attention. And it was pretty easy, right? Okay, and now it's your turn. Pause the course again and do it. Yes. Just do it. Thank you. If you have run any command here on the worksheet, you probably already noticed this. I get my results here. And if I run another command, the results are again here. So any command I run by default overrides the results from the previous one. That is just what I need in most cases, but sometimes I want to preserve some commands results. And I'm going to show you the different ways we have to do it. The first one is by pinning the results with this button here. When I do that, the results from the next command I run will be displayed in a different tab. And my previous results are still there. And I can do it every time I need to keep the results from a query. The only downside is that they are called query result with a number, which doesn't help much to remember what they are. I can see the SQL when I hover the mouse, and I can also see it if I click on SQL but that's not really very efficient. I'm going to unpin this. And as you can see, they are gone now. And I want to keep this one now, but this time, instead of pinning it like before, I'm going to right click on the tab title and rename it. And I'm going to do the same with this one. I still have my results here, but now I know exactly what they are just by looking at the tab name. As you can see, they got pinned, but I did it in a different way. Now let's see a third method to keep the results of our queries. This time I'm going to go to Tools, Preferences, Database, and Worksheet. Here there's an option to show query results in new tabs, so I'm going to check it to show you how it works. When this option is on, every command result will be automatically pinned. So every time you run a query, a new result tab will be created, even if you are running the same command several times. This obviously will use more resources from your machine, and you can end up with dozens of tabs here, which you are probably going to want to close at some point. I personally don't like this option and never use it. But I know several people that do like it, so you might want to give it a try and see if you find it nice or useful. All right, see you in the next lecture. In this tip, I'm going to show you how you can export data from SQL Developer. Let's say I want to export this result. One of the ways I can do it is I can select the cells I'm interested in and press Ctrl-C to copy. 
and then go to some other program such as Excel, for example, and paste it with Control V. But the problem with this method is that I get the data, but I don't have the column header, so I don't know what is what. But there's an easy fix to that, which many people don't know. And it is that if instead of Control C, you press Control Shift C, you get the data and the column headers. You can also export this data by right clicking anywhere here on the results and then selecting the export option. This will make the export wizard appear and it will let you change some settings that define how the export will be performed. In this example, I'm going to use the insert format and I'm going to change the path where my export file will be created. For this example, I'm going to put it on my desktop. I'm going to proceed to the summary and finish. So let's see what we got. As you can see, this option generates an insert for every row in the results set we exported, which can be very useful in some cases. Now let's try some other format, PDF for example. There are some optional things I could define here, but I'm only going to change the path again. Let's see what we got this time. Pretty nice. How about HTML? Look at this. Isn't that cool? As you can see, there are several other options. You can create Excel files or generate XML or JSON or use any other of the available formats. Now, let me show you something. I'm going to add a short comment here and I'm going to run it, but not as a statement, but as a script. Take a look at this. Now I'm going to change this to insert, for example. As you can see, I can tell it the format in which I want my results just by adding a simple comment. Check this out. It is a complete HTML document, which is awesome. Well, at least to me it is. And if you want to write it to a file, you can use the spool command, which might be known for those who have used SQL Plus before SQL Developer. So what export formats can you use here? Well, pretty much any format you can generate from the wizard, except Excel and PDF. And if you want to export a table, 
just look for it here in the connections panel, right click on it and select the export option. Here there are some settings that are similar to the ones we saw before, but you can also decide whether you want to export the table creation script or DDL and the data. So as you see, exporting data with SQL Developer is very easy, and there are several ways to do it, which is great. In this lecture, I'm going to talk about a feature of the SQL Editor that is called Call Templates. I use the search box here, but you can find it under database SQL editor called templates. It works by letting you type what you have here and expanding it into what you have here. So for example, if I type this double I, it will be expanded into this insert statement we see here. Let me show you. I type the template ID, which in this case is II, and then I press control spacebar. Let's try another one. SSF, for example, for the very commonly used select star from table. So SSF, control spacebar, and now I can write the real table name. But let's see if we can make it better. As you can see, there are a couple of templates that have brackets here. I'm going to create a new template to show you how brackets are used. I'm going to use SSFW as the ID, and it will be expanded into select star from table where conditions. So when I use this, I will get this code. Okay, let's try it. SSFW, control spacebar. And look, I still need to replace table with my actual table name, but it is already selected. So I can just start typing or selecting my table from the list without needing to do anything else. And then I just press the tab key and it jumps directly to the placeholder for my conditions. And again, I can start typing right away. Let's see another example. I'm going to create another template called SSFR, which will be similar to the previous one. But now I'm going to use a specific condition on the raw num pseudo column with a placeholder for the actual volume. So SSFR cut five. As you can see, this feature can really help you write code faster if you have certain type of commands you use frequently. Okay, now don't wait until you finish this course. Press the pause button now and think of the commands you use more frequently and proceed to create templates for them. You will be writing code faster in no time. Okay, pause now. There's another feature that is somehow similar to the code templates, which is called snippets. Snippets are code fragments that you can use if you don't remember the syntax of some function or SQL construct you don't use very frequently, or if for any reason you don't want to write it yourself. Maybe you are just feeling lazy.
There are several groups or categories, each one with many snippets in it to choose from. To use a snippet, you just have to click on it and drag it into the editor. For example, if you don't remember how to code a dance rank, you can simply drag it into the editor and you will get an example you can use to build your query. There are lots of different snippets. Some of them more complex than others. For example, this cursor snippet is a complete PLSQL block that includes all the operations you will typically want to do with a cursor. As you can see, snippets have tooltips that will help you understand what they are. And there are even snippets for database administrators, such as these ones related to flashback features. And you can also create your own snippets. So this is another feature that can be really helpful. But uh, some other SQL developer features, it's sometimes overlooked. Okay, you should go check out snippets now. See you in the next lecture. In this tip, I'm going to show you how you can generate relational diagrams from your tables in SQL Developer. This is a pretty cool feature if you ask me. The first way to do it is by opening the table details window for the table which you want to diagram. So I'm going to open the details window for my employees table. I click on connection, then I select tables, and then click on the desired table. Another way to get here is by clicking on the table name here in the worksheet while pressing the control key. See? When I press control, the table name becomes a link. Okay, I have a lot of information here which includes the definition of the columns, the data, and a lot of other things which you can check if you are interested. But in this case, I'm interested in this tab here that says model. So I'm going to click on it. And there it is, a relational diagram that includes the table I selected and all other tables that have a direct relationship with the one I selected. That is, tables that have a foreign key that references this table or tables which are referenced by a foreign key in this table. And if I want to include another table that is not directly related to the one you selected, but is related to one of the tables in the diagram, you can right-click on the table and select Show Parent and Child Tables. In this case, the location table was added because the department's table has a foreign key that references the location table. Pretty cool, huh? And there is another way to generate relational diagrams in SQL Developer. You may already know this, but there is a separate tool that is called SQL Developer Data Modeler, which was specifically designed to simplify modeling tasks. But what many people don't know is that Data Modeler is actually included in SQL Developer as an extension. So you can use Data Modeler features from SQL Developer. So if you want to build a diagram that includes tables that are not related to each other, or want to be able to export your diagram as an image file or PDF, you can use Data Modeler this way. Click on the View menu, then select Data Modeler, and then Browser. This will open this section here. Now we expand this design and right click on Relational Models. And then click on New Relational Model. And now, from the Tables list, you can select all the tables you want to include and drag them into the diagram.
And there you have your diagram, which includes the tables you selected even if they were not related to each other. And if you hold control while dragging the tables into the model, it will include the related tables as well, even if you didn't select them from the tables list. For example, I could select only this table, but if I hold control while dragging it, it will include these other tables too, which is also very useful. And now you can go to File, Data Modeler, Print Diagram, and print to an image file or to a PDF. This can be very useful if you document your designs. And there is another way. I can also go to File, Data Modeler, Import, Data Dictionary. Here I just want to select the connection I want to use. Then here I select the schema I want to diagram. And here I select the tables I want to include. So I'm going to select them all and finish. I'm going to close this log view. And there it is. A relational diagram of my whole schema. So is this feature cool or not? I know. See you in the next tip. In this lesson, I talk about two features that are actually unrelated, but I decided to put them together because they are very short. The first one is the navigation filter. When you connect to a database, by default, you will see all these types of objects here, and that makes sometimes difficult to find what you are looking for. For example, if I'm looking for a type, first I need to find the types node here, among all of these nodes. But if you don't use all of these types of objects, and you know you don't really need to see them here, you can make SQL Developer show you only the ones you use. To do that, you need to go to Preferences, Database, Navigation Filter. Once there, you need to select this checkbox to enable navigation tree filtering. And then you can unselect the things you don't want to see. For example, if I only want to see functions, procedures, packages, and types, I can unselect everything and then mark only those nodes. Once you press OK, you will see a reduce tree here. It will usually refresh automatically to reflect the changes, but in case that doesn't happen, you just press this refresh button here. I like it, do you? And the second thing I wanted to show you in this lesson is this results grid. As you can see, this doesn't look like the default grid. It has different colors for the rows, which can make the results easier to read, especially when you have results set with many columns. To get your results like this, you just need to go to Preferences, Database, Worksheet, and here select this option that says Grid in Checkerboard or Zebra Pattern. And that's it. If you like it, Go ahead and change it right away. See you in the next lesson. This lecture includes several short tips. I decided to put them together because they are very short and changing lectures every few seconds might not be the most pleasing experience for you. So let's take a look at the first one. SQL Developer keeps a record of the commands you run in what is called the SQL history. To view your history, you can simply press the F8 key or use the view menu and then selecting SQL history. You can use this box to find your commands more easily. And once you have found the command you want, you can use this button to append it to the editor or you can use this one to replace what you have there. I find this feature very useful and I use it a lot. Next tip. You might remember that we use the control spacebar key combination in the code templates lecture. This is actually the autocomplete key combination. So besides using it to call code templates, you can use it to autocomplete table and column names when writing SQL code. If there's only one match, it will autocomplete it immediately.
And if there is more than one, it will display a list of the available options, as you see here. You may also remember that we can use the line gutter to see line numbers. But even if you have not set it to display line numbers, you can go to a specific line by pressing Ctrl G. This can be particularly useful when you are working with a very large script or have your editor full with lots of commands you have been running during your current session. Okay, next tip. You probably know that you can use the describe command to see the structure of a database object. For example, if I need to see the names and types of some tables columns to write a query, I can describe it and I get the results here in the script output. But I can also press Shift F4 while I'm on the object name in the editor and I get a floating window with much more information about it. which I can keep open while I continue writing and running my queries. If I use it with a procedure or function, I immediately get its code in a new editor window, which is really great. There's most likely going to be a time when you have more than one editor worksheet open and you want to switch between them. If you are like me that prefer to do things with the keyboard, then here is how you can do it. You can move to the editor worksheet that is to the left by pressing Shift F5. And you can move to the right by pressing Shift Alt F5. And you can move to the last worksheet you were at by pressing Control Tab Tab. That is Control Tab and then without releasing control, tab again. Actually, if you press control, tab, tab, and don't release the control key, you get a list of the different program sections or tabs you have open, and you can continue hitting tab until you get to the one you want to focus on. So there you have it, a quick and easy way to switch between tabs using the keyboard. The first tip in this lesson helps you change text to uppercase, lowercase, or in it cap very easily. You just have to press Ctrl plus Shift plus single quote, and it will toggle between uppercase, lowercase, and in it cap. This can be useful because the code formatter is currently not very flexible regarding case change. There is a preference for the completion inside that offers some additional options, but if you activate it, it will change the case automatically, whereas this option lets you change it on demand. Next tip. This is a keyboard shortcut that I use very frequently. And I really mean very frequently. This tip helps you comment and uncomment lines of code very easily. You just have to press Ctrl and Slash at the same time, and it will comment the current line of code, or will uncomment it if it is currently commented, and after that it will move to the next line. For example, I sometimes want to test different versions of a query, and I have something like this. So if I want to test the second where clause, I just need to do this. And you can also select more than one line of code and comment or uncomment them with a single action. Pretty easy, right? Okay, next tip. I know I have already said this more than once, but I prefer to use the keyboard instead of the mouse whenever I can. But one operation that made me use the mouse before I was made aware of this shortcut was when I needed to copy data from the results grid and then continue writing and running commands. 
I had to click here on the results and do whatever I wanted to do there, and then click here on the editor again to continue writing code. But it turns out that there is also a keyboard shortcut to navigate between those areas. To go to the results grid, you just have to press Alt and page down. And to go to the editor, you have to press Alt and page up. And that's it. So I can write a query and run it. Then hit Control page down to copy the results. Then go somewhere else to paste them. And then after getting back to SQL Developer, just hit Control page up and continue writing code. All of this without needing to use the mouse at all, which to me is pretty awesome. I feel very efficient when I do things like this. See you later. In this lecture, I'm going to show you something that is not new, but many people don't know and is actually pretty cool. This is probably not something you are going to find particularly useful for your job or your learning process, and that's why I put it here in this extra section. But you are most likely going to like it. And if you are creative, you might find some pretty cool uses for it. Okay, let's see what I'm talking about. I'm going to use a very simple query for this example. Okay, now I'm going to add something here. Check this out. Now let me change something. As you can see, it is not like it displayed bigger just because I used HTML. It's actually interpreting my HTML code. Now this part, although it's actually needed to structure the HTML code correctly, you can take it out and it will still work. I use this, but you can also do something like this. And this. And even this. So you can change the face, the size, the color. And not only that, you can even do something like this. Can you believe it? And this is an actual image from the web. And now I'm going to show you something else. I'm going to copy this code. Here I'm going to add a new template. I'm going to call it blue and I'm going to use this code. So, select blue control spacebar table name. It was a little easier, right? Let's see how we can make it better. Here it is. I'm going to add this and this. So select
Oops, wrong table. Okay, but it's still not very generic. I'm gonna correct this one. And I'm gonna add another new template and I'm gonna call it color. And this one is not going to have a fixed color. So I can now do something like this. Select color, blue, color, green for example, from cat. That's a little better, isn't it? Now, templates are usually used for things you do frequently, which is probably not going to be the case with HTML. But I'd use the opportunity to mix them here so that you can get an idea of how you can mix features to simplify and do cool things. What else can we do with HTML? I'm going to use it to change how nulls are displayed. Let's try it. Select star from No, not called tables, but all tables. So as you can see, you are not limited to using HTML only in your code. It can actually be used in some of SQL developer settings too. And that's it. Now you know you can use HTML code in SQL developer. So what do you think of this? Do me a favor, please share your thoughts in the discussion section. I would really like to know what's on your mind right now about this, and if you think you are going to use it for something someday. Great! Thanks for watching. Hey, welcome back. Here is something new for this extra section. In this lesson, I will show you how you can display gauges in the results of your queries. This can be very useful because gauges give you a visual or graphical representation of the values, instead of just a number. This is how they look like. Pretty nice, don't you think? Now let's see how they are built. This part here is what builds the gauge. These two keywords are always the same. They are what tells SQL developer that we want a gauge. Then the first value here, which in this case is this number one, is the minimum value that can be represented in the gauge. Then the second value is the maximum value, which in this case is 25,000. Then it comes the low threshold, which in this case is 2,500. The low threshold is this colored area you see here at the left side of the gauge and it can be useful to see which rows have a value below a predefined limit or threshold. Then it comes the high threshold, which in this case is 15,000 and works in a similar way than the low threshold, but in this case to see values that are over a predefined limit. The high threshold is this red area you see here to the right. And finally, you must provide the column or expression that provides the actual values for the gauges. In this case, I am concatenating the salary because that is the value I want to display. So, to summarize, to build the gauge you need the minimum, maximum, low threshold, high threshold, and finally the actual value, which is represented by the black bar you see here in the middle of the gauge. Okay, just in case you are wondering, as you can see, this is a string, which means that you could build it dynamically, based on the values stored in your database. So you don't need to hard code these values if you don't want to. I'm not going to show you that here because that will be done using SQL functions, and SQL is out of the scope of this course. 
My goal here was only to show you that SQL Developer can display these beautiful gauges as part of the results of your queries. The syntax and the necessary parameters to build the gauges might not be very easy to memorize, so if you like them, you should consider creating a code snippet or a template to help remember the syntax in the future. Okay, that's it for this lesson. See you later. Hey, welcome back. In this lecture, we are going to download and install the database system. The Oracle database can be installed on Windows or Linux only. In this lesson, I will show you the installation process on Windows, but doing it on Linux is also an easy task. I have included a link to the official downloads page in the resources section of this lecture, so click on the resources button and then click on the download link. Once you get to the site, the first thing you need to do is to accept the license agreement. And then you need to select the appropriate download for your operating system, which can be Windows 64 bits, Windows 32 bits, or Linux. Then on the download page, if you already have an Oracle account, just enter your email and password and click on this red button. If you don't have an account, just click on the Create Account button to create one for free. You just need to fill in the requested details, which will take you just a few minutes. When prompted, make sure to save the download and wait for it to complete. I didn't include the whole download process here as there is no point in showing you that in the video. So please pause the video now and unpause it when your download finishes. See you later. Okay, now that the download has finished, go to your downloads folder. Extract the zip file and run the installer. I have accelerated the process here to save some time, but in reality, this process can take several minutes. We will install the Express Edition version 11G because Oracle has not released an Express Edition for version 12C yet. And I think the Express Edition is ideal for learning because it is lightweight. I mean, it doesn't require a lot of resources to run. And Express Edition is free to use, even for commercial purposes. You could legally use the standard edition for educational purposes too. And Oracle has made available a virtual machine with the standard edition instance already installed and configured. But to make the virtual machine run smoothly, you need to assign a lot of RAM to it. I have a virtual machine with an Express Edition running very well with less than 2 gigabytes of RAM. But I tested the virtual machine of the standard edition with 4 gigabytes, and it was still slow. OK, when prompted, accept the license and confirm the destination folder. In my case, I accepted the default location. Here you need to define a password for the sys and system accounts. 
You will need this password to create other user accounts, grant privileges, and so on. So make sure to choose one that you won't forget. Or better yet, write it down now. Yes, I know, I know. Writing passwords is usually not something you should do. But this time I do recommend it because you will be using this database for learning purposes only. And you won't be storing any important information in it. You won't believe the number of times I've seen this question asked on internet forums. I don't remember the password of my database. How do I reset it? So this is what you are going to do. Open your email and send yourself an email with this text. This is the password for the CIS account on my test Oracle database. And write your password there. OK. After entering and confirming your password, click Next and Install, and wait for the installer to finish. Again, I accelerated the process here, but it can take several minutes on your computer. You should be very happy that you are learning SQL with an Oracle database, because in my opinion, Oracle is definitely the best relational database available today. It can handle big amounts of information very efficiently. And regarding SQL, it includes a lot of features and functions that allow you to do wonderful things with your data. I really enjoy working with Oracle SQL. And I think you will too. I really do. OK, now that this has finished, you have a new shortcut on your desktop, which opens a very simple database administration tool. To log in, you can use the Sys account. The tool offers some information about storage, sessions, and database parameters. Take a look at the site if you want to, but this is probably the last time you will see it as part of this course activities, because from now on, you will be focusing on the development side of working with the database. Okay. You are now ready to continue with the next lesson. See you there.